Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, the 22nd of May. Welcome back to the D3D Thor Football Podcast dedicated to all things Leagues 1 and 2. And welcome to a episode where we'll review the League 1 playoff final and have a look at the two semi-final legs of League 2, which are finished, and the final, which is set up for next Saturday. It's five of us on this call today. It is myself, David Jenkin, Chris Stringer, Aaron Diskin and James Richards. David, how are we doing? Tired, mate. I feel like just... That might be a common theme amongst these five here. <laughs> I, I think so. I just think this week has been... Uh, there's been a lot of football and there's been a lot to watch and it's uh, it's been very interesting. It's very tiring watching from a TV screen, isn't it? Chris, how are we doing? Well, I had the realisation yesterday that uh, Oldham will play Dorking Wanderers yesterday, so I'm absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I've had to Google where that was as well, which is, um, it's going to be fun to see them go there. They've got to go to Maidstone as well. There's quite a few around that area, isn't it? It is a very, I was looking at the, the, the map of the league and it, I think there's like five in the it's north. It's a very north-south divide, isn't it? The, the, the rest are in London apart yeah. from um, Tor- Torquay and um, Yeovil. Yeah, there's some, there's some new trips in there. There's probably some old ones as well. Could be fun for old. Aaron, how are we doing ourselves? Hello, mate. Um, I'm back after another fresh win at the bingo yesterday, so I can't even <laughs> sleep. Are you secretly an 85-year-old woman and we don't realise it? I, th- I think so. I think it's my calling. <laughs> I think it's my calling. Okay. James, you at the bingo yourself? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shame. No, but I, I am enjoy actually it. sitting here quite fortunate that I now have a chance to see Oldham play away at three different grounds that are about 20 minutes from where I live and a couple of others that are, you know, about an hour away. It's, it's pretty good, you know. Well, I, think, I think you're being fast and loose with the phrase ground. You know, it's yeah, they're it is a ground. Woking's a good at ground. Aldershot is... I wouldn't account. call it stadiums where they're going, but they are grounds, yeah. Dor- Dorking's, <laughs> uh, you know, Dorking's not bad. It's a local it's, park. Uh, so, no, they've, they've, done, they've done some good work down at Dorking. Proper community club... It, their rise compared to, say, Salford's, for example, has been, yes, they've had a little bit of financial backing, but actually it's, it's about being really well run. And that's, yeah. and they're now at the heart, they really are at the heart of the, the community in, in Dorking, which is, is great to so say. It's the kind of thing we want football clubs to be. We want football yeah. clubs to rise up the football pyramid, uh, in the way that on merit. they have, rather yeah. than, on merit rather than big financial spending or being fortunate to move a football club 70 miles from its home and plonk it in your town and call it <laughs> yeah well we won't go into that one but yeah <laughs> we kind of have you know. but you know yeah there you go but yeah no that's good and Chris Hargreaves ex-Oxford captain I've got to get an Oxford uh, lead in my intro here uh, now uh, the manager at uh, at Yeovil so there you go mm, indeed Indeed. A reminder before we get going that this podcast is in partnership with The Big Step, which tackles football's relationship with gambling. There is an excessive presence of gambling adverts within football, and The Big Step continues to do great work to raise awareness about the dangers of gambling and the impact it can have on so many people's lives. So we'll get going. They are they are brilliant. Sorry, it's just but yeah. yeah, they are brilliant. And there's also been that news, isn't there, that as the white paper that the government produces, that they are going to ban, I think, is it many clubs from having a oh, oh, better sponsors, yeah. Yeah, on shirt sponsorship, that is absolute great progress. If we can get that white paper passed through, I, I I completely agree with it. I mean, I'm of the age where I remember clubs being sponsored by electronic companies like JVC, Sharp, and proper companies. You know, I I don't want to see any more Premier League or Championship clubs sponsored by betting companies or or bookmakers. And some of them are just like obscure Chinese or or Asian companies that don't actually allow people in this country to use their service. It's all about you know, branding and getting their label seen on TV in their country. I mean, it's it's completely wrong, and I'm I'm really glad that there's a government white paper on it, and hopefully, uh, it will put an end to to that kind of sponsorship in certainly in the top of the top echelons of football, which is only a good thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll get going, and we're going to begin with the world's best third tier. League one. League one. We had just one game to talk about. It was yesterday. At Wembley, Sunderland against Wickham Wanderers, and we have a happy Chris Stringer on the podcast because Sunderland have finally got back into the Championship. Chris, oh, they've finally done it, and, and what a fantastic performance! Um, I, I don't have Sky Sports, so I was listening to it on the on the radio yesterday, and it, yeah, I, I was enjoying myself. Um, since they've dropped down to League One, I've, I've developed a little bit of a soft spot for them, and uh, it, it was it was really nice to see them get that win. Yeah, absolutely. They beat Wickham 2-0. Um, 
I think certainly, having watched this myself, I thought it was Sunderland at the very best under Alex yeah. Neil, which we've seen them. And Wickham just unable to really find an answer to the defensive shape and this clinical edge that the Black Cats had. The first goal to Sunderland came from Elliot Embleton. Uh, it was 12 minutes in. It's a moment to forget to David Stockdale, you have to say, really. Reacting to, just didn't react in time to the flight of the ball. It went in off his forearm. It's pretty disappointing in perspective, you have to say, David. Not great to see. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly not his finest hour. It, I'm not sure what's happened there, to be honest with you. I think it's, I think it looks like he's just either not expecting the shot at all, or when it has come, he's just, he's just been so slow to react. It's just a complete misjudgment. But of course, that, I mean, Sunderland is certainly not going to complain because that sort of set them up for the rest of the game at that point, didn't it? Um, it, it didn't really look like they were they were going to lose that game. I think after after that moment, I mean, Wickham came for them, but um, I, I, don't, I just don't think Wickham offered enough on on the day, if I'm honest. And I think Sunderland probably cruised a bit more than they would have expected to. Yeah, I feel like we'll all be in agreement with that, certainly, won't we, James? And I found Sunderland quite good value for their half-time lead, really. You look at their wide players, Alex Pritchard, Patrick Roberts, they were incredibly lively in possession, receiving the ball front-footed around the halfway line, driving forwards, getting past men at every opportunity. Some very good sharp movement and passing into that right channel in particular, linking up between them. And you compare Sunderland to Wickham in that first half, who just, Wickham looked like a team for me that were just relying on a set piece. They were waiting for an opportunity to get a Joe Jacobson corner swinging into the edge of the box to make it really difficult for them. Their open play creativity was very limited. You'd have Gareth McCleary or Jordan Obita out wide who'd get crossing positions, but all they had to hit in the box was Sam Vokes. All I they had just, to hit yeah, was that. I agree, I agree completely. And Bailey Wright and Danny Bart did very well with a lot of those crosses. Yeah, and the only time that Bailey Wright sort of misjudged the ball and Vokes got clean through, Patterson came up big. Yep. I mean, how big a save that was, we'll never yep. really know, but in the context of the game at the time, it felt massive, didn't it? He quickly reacted, got out to stop Vokes scoring, um, he was quite fortunate the ball didn't quite settle for Vokes, who, who couldn't get it out from under his feet quick enough. Otherwise, it probably would have been a, a easier chance. But yeah, I agree. I think Sunderland were at, they came out of the blocks flying. And I think uh, Alex Neal probably knew they had to do that to unsettle Wickham. You don't like you don't want to get Wickham into a pattern or into their groove because they can be very hard to break down. But I agree. Roberts was excellent. Pritchard and Hamilton also I think Corey Evans in that midfield with Luke mm-hmm. O'Nine really dominated and the Wickham midfield looked non-existent. I mean, they, did, you know, I'd say as much as they didn't really, they didn't turn up at all for the first 20 minutes. They were so poor Wickham in that first sort of opening quarter of the, of the game. But uh, that's probably more down to how well Sunderland played than, than Wickham's shortcomings. And I think, you know, the golf in quality between the two sides was there to see on the day. Um, really well done to Alex Neal because I think he's a great, coach and Sunderland have probably made the right call with him um, and I hope you know he should be able to take them into the championship as a man who's ex- been very experienced in that division and, and keep them moving forward because this is a club now that needs to do that all very well in getting out of League One but they need to keep moving forward and keep progressing have a good season next year um, you know but I was watching this on the Sky Go app and I have to say it was so far behind that Niall Quinn was still up front for Sunderland so yeah. <laughs> why do you do Sky Go? Now TV is the best way to do it, James. I don't have Sky, so I have to get it off of a family member's subscription, basically on the on the Sky Go app. It dates back to the nineties. Yeah, well, it's just so the, the, the feed is so thing. far behind all the time. Like I'm watching goals going on Twitter, and thinking, well, they haven't kicked off yet on my Sky Go. That's why you get off social media when you're watching live football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. it does ruin it for you. They don't seem to have updated Sky Go in about five years. So no. It's still. <laughs> <laughs> No. Still playing, yeah. There's, I, there's I, no, they haven't rebranded League One or Two yet on my, on my. Still the third fourth division, still D three D four, literally. It, yeah. it, it, We're waiting the for the Premier League to League arrive this, 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 uh, this uh, September. League <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I found certainly in this game, I think Wickham became a lot more involved after half time into the match. But it, it reminded me of that first leg, which we talked about previously at the Stadium of Light against Sheffield Wednesday, really, where a lot of Wickham's possession, much like Sheffield Wednesday, was kind of out wide around the halfway line. They had very little in terms of meaningful touches in and around the penalty box. In fact, Wickham's best moments, rather than crosses into the box, were probably actually direct balls straight up to Sam Vokes. We had a couple of occasions, you mentioned one there, Jays, where it dropped over Bailey Wright's head to Sam Vokes and Nathan Pat. And- I keep calling him Nathan Patterson. That's not. He's a fullback at Everton. It's Anthony Patterson. He was excellent <laughs> off his line to come and stop him from getting that moment. There was a moment in the first half as well where a direct pass played up. A bit of a mix-up between Wright and Bart and a poor header from Gooch. Loose ball. The Vokes just couldn't quite get onto. 
but largely I would say Sunderland had a very good control on this and I was so impressed with the defensive structure that Alex Neil would get had Sunderland set up and much like we've seen across this playoffs you noticed it when Gareth McClurry got the ball out wide for instance and he's got to pick votes out and he's just got a sea of red and white bodies around him to try and get through it was so impressive Aaron the second goal the clincher essentially from Ross Stewart on 79 minutes who's had a fantastic season I felt like the game was done at that point there was still 10 minutes left to play plus added time but did you always feel that Alex Neil Sunderland would just hold out and maybe even potentially sneak a third on the break? Yeah, well, I kind of thought like, after the first goal, I thought it was it was Sunderland's game, you know. And I feel like in this game, I kind of feel like Wickham felt a little bit leggy to me, a little bit tired, and I wonder whether the sort of direct physical nature of the the game that they've been playing this season that has done them so well has actually finally caught up with them and took took it out the legs a little bit and I just didn't think they could get like near Sunderland really apart from that like James was saying that maybe that uh, period just after half time but listen when you've got Ross Stewart in the form that he's in and that's his 26th goal of the season that's always going to make you comfy I don't think um, Sunderland never were really under a prolonged period of um, pressure and I think they were the deserved winners really. It was sort of 10 minutes in the second half when Wickham looked like they might they might get something, but for the rest of it, Sunderland were just so so tactically strong again. We we, we spoke about it in the semi-finals, how structured they are. Do you remember like when Charlie White left, though, there was all this, oh my goodness, who's going to score our goals? I think Ross Stewart, I mean, he stepped up amazingly this season. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't see this coming from him, to be honest, based on the performances I saw last season. Yeah, he was busy, energetic, you could see he's got potential, but you know, to, to be the player he has been for them, the sort of icon up front, um, he deserves a lot of credit and, and, and the way that he's played, I think, in the systems, he's quite an unselfish player for someone who scored over 20 goals as well. So and he, you know, six goals, he has the build and the attributes to be a lone striker, which, yeah, which been, is testament he's been excellent. to him. He has been yeah. good. I don't know about anyone else out of you boys, but for a lot of that game, I, I was watching it thinking this looks like a decent championship side playing a League One team here. The, yeah. set, the setup from Sunderland generally was so impressive as it has been across all three of their playoff games, the two legs against Sheffield Wednesday and this final. And when I look back, even if you look at Sunderland's just three games here, they feel like a team that I could think could do more than just survive in the championship next season. I would always say to the clubs coming out of League One, given the gap between those two divisions, survival is the first objective, certainly, and that should be a good season. But this Alex Neil setup, which is so solid, so clinical, so relentless right to the very end, its ability to grab late goals... I'd be feeling pretty good, James, about Sunderland next season if they got a bit of solid recruitment behind them. Yeah, like I said, I agree, I think, because Alex Neal's a, a coach who, I mean, to be honest, if they'd had him all season, I think Sunderland would have been much closer to automatic promotion. Just looking at the way he's got them playing. I mean, the, you know, I like the fact he's got Serkin and, and Gooch as their sort of fullbacks because they're mobile players who can get forward. And in the championship, you need that. You need to be very mobile. You need to have good attacking threat, but also solidity. And I think Evans and 09 do that. They will recruit well. I'm sure Sunderland's still a big draw for a lot of players. Um, I think it's important that they maintain the kind of idea of recruitment that they'll, that they, that they need to avoid from the previous years. Do you remember how many players they had on big contracts when they came back to League One who (laughs) who were just, they they were mercenaries. A lot lot of the players that were there were literally there because of the big money that they'd been offered, not because they were particularly interested in playing for Sunderland. Who was the fellow on 50 grand a week or something? Jack Rodwell. Yeah, it was. was. They had Rodwell. They had um, a couple of guys who were, a couple of French guys who were. Well, they don't need shut. They'd gone back to back relegation, so there were still people with Premier League wages in that team. Yeah, and and it just looked like a bunch of disinterested players, and and you could see like sort of uh, was it Catamol who played for them? And yes. been there? Mm-hmm. he looked really peeved having to play with these kind of players who he knew just the dressing room was just shot, wasn't it? Because they had no uh, camaraderie. They looked like a team who were really on a downward spiral. Alex Neil won't allow those kind of players to join his team. I think it's very important that Sunderland maintain a very strict recruitment policy where they get players in who want to be there and that will play the kind of football that, that Alex Neal has been so successful with in his brief spell um, with the Black Cats so far. But yeah, I agree. Ed. Basically, they'll be fine next season. I do not I do not worry about them uh, coming straight back down. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to see how Rotherham do in the championship because obviously their yo-yo uh, is now up to, what is it, six years in a row? They They've just need a quiet that. season, don't they? They just want one more. They, don't, they don't do quiet seasons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not the Paul Wall, they don't. Not the Paul Wall. Uh, David... Yeah. 
David Wickham, we've got to give a mention to them. I think their emotions probably going to be quite raw after that Wembley defeat, but I think they'll look back on this as an excellent season. They've, they've done a, a, a playoff finish, seen off Milton Keynes Dons over two legs, ultimately just not able to compete enough on the day. You still can't not be impressed by what Gareth Ainsworth was able to get this group of players to do each season. I completely agree. And I'm, I mean, I think at the very least, they've probably, bar obviously winning this playoff final, to me, they've probably met a lot of the objectives they would have had for this season anyway, to at least be in that conversation. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, Ainsworth himself said that it was a big achievement to be in Wembley for this team anyway. And I completely agree. Like it, it was definitely a really good moment for them to be there. Um, I, I don't feel too worried about them going into next season though, to be honest. I feel like that, I feel like they'll be absolutely fine. Ainsworth is very good at recruiting and he's very good at building a team that people will underestimate. And I think that's become sort of almost to a certain degree, their brand really, that they're, they're an outfit that are continuously underestimated and continue to, in some people's eyes, I guess, overperform. But to me, this is the level that Wickham should be at. It's just unfortunate on the day, but um, yeah, no, to be honest, yeah, I think they'll be absolutely fine next year. And I think we'll see them in and around the playoffs or maybe the automatics, depending on other people's, um, you know, depending on other teams recruitment. But I'd, I'd imagine they'll be in and around these areas next year as well. Does anyone think Gareth Ainsworth will be poached and, and leave this summer? By There's it? always yeah. a talk, isn't there? Yeah, I don't think so. He loves it, though, doesn't he? He's been yeah. there for so the, the long. The thing I have for like, me is... Do do other you know Wickham fans are so used to the effectiveness of his football and we know it's not aesthetically pleasing but we know it can get the job done. I always feel like some other fan bases would be a lot more judgmental of it if it didn't win from the start. Yeah, that's the way I, I feel with it. I, I suppose the question for Ainsworth is, can he take Wickham much further? Um, well, he can definitely but, take them back into the championship because they've done it before. Sure, sure, but I mean, if if we're if we're talking. You know, relegation battles in the championship, promotion pushing League One. You know, it's you're in the same. So robbery. What what's Wickham's ceiling though? And and that's the thing, isn't it? it? People forget that it was it was Martin O'Neill who brought this club out of non-league. They they're yeah. not a club. I mean, in my lifetime, they're not a club that had this long history of being a football league club. They're no, not no. like Luton or someone who had been in the top flight in the 80s with Oxford and, you know, had always got, you always felt, even in the National League, when they were down there, they had massive potential to, yeah. to go further. They've got this new ground still, I think, coming in the town centre at Luton, which is would be great if they can get that done because they've been talking about leaving Kenilworth Road since I was about two. I mean, it's, or probably even before that. I mean, it's, it's I don't feel that with Wickham, to be honest. I think they're a club that have always been... League One, League Two, sort of size of Well, I, I like the way they're trying to run things off the pitch. They haven't, they haven't got the academy system like they have. They've got this kind of development squad, haven't they? Yeah. With the idea of That's the way to you do see it. A lot of young players come through now, certainly. They're trying to academy. do a bit of a Brentford approach, aren't they? Well, academies cost a lot. Brentford do. were right in doing what they did because Brentford realised that we've got an academy, but what's the point of having an academy and spending all this money on it when the big clubs can come and poach all our best talent and we get nothing for it? So cut the academy, have the development squad, take all the best players when they're 17. That, uh, and look at their, you know, they use data, don't they, Brentford? We all know that. So they look at the data behind these guys and, and they use analysis to see if there's any underlying numbers that they feel suggest these players have more potential than other clubs seeing them. And if Wickham can do that, but I think the other thing Wickham's done really well is the match day experience. They've really put a lot of effort into that. It's, it's a great club. Apart from the fireworks set off after wins. Well, that's, that's just stupid. It's just, it's just not <laughs> that's just there. ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? That's kind of, they've got American owners, haven't they? Um, <laughs> so they can yeah. they can they can pack that nonsense in, but actually having the the beer tent and the bands and the and the sort of fan zone that's that's excellent and that's something that makes the match day experience um, all the more pleasurable and also grow your fan base because families will bring their kids it'll be a, a day out and they'll they'll retain all those fans regardless of the sort of uh, I guess the inconsistencies that football tends to have on the football pitch. I haven't got the number at the top of my head. Was it twenty three thousand at Wembley yesterday? I don't know if anyone knows. Well, well, 72, fans. oh, Wickham fans, I was going to say, it was 72,000. Yeah. yeah, it was about 20... 45,000 Sunderland, I think they said, so... Well, yeah, when Oxford went 23, into the National League playoff final, we took Wickham. about 35,000 Oxford fans, so they probably, they've been there before. When you've been to Wembley before, it's harder to get, like, your grandma and your sister and all that to, to come with you. <sighs> yeah, but Wickham were at Wembley two years ago and there was no one there. I'd, I'd love to see Oldham get. I suppose yeah, we've, not, that. yeah. We, we've, we've not been there since the early nineties. So I'd love to see how many we'd take. <laughs> All of Oldham would 
I think so, yeah. Every trophy now, Chris, got to get used to that. <laughs> this is the horrible thing. Oh, that's today, if, actually. My, my big worry is that next season we end up doing something miraculous, but it's during a boycott. <laughs> yeah, that would be very old. Of, that would you, be. You'll be you'll be in, uh, in a relegation battle again. Almost, I, think, so. I, think, I think that's the more likely to uh, yeah. set of events here. Yeah. Yeah. So depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk? Uh, that, One uh, fun thing I want to talk about with Wicked. Ed, have you got the Samaritans line there? Just, just worry about Aaron. <laughs> I can find a number. I can find a number. Final thing to talk about with Wickham. Um, we talked about hopefully them going again. Sam Vokes, the top scorer, is tied down to new contract. That was Adebayo, I can tell was final game in professional football. There was a lot of talk around the narrative of him. I think, was it you, Aaron, who said that he got man the match on the BBC page? Was that voted as it? Bit of a... Yeah, apparently. Uh, we, we, we established that it was fan voted. I thought it was a bit oh, weird. Right, okay. uh, a bit weird, yeah. yeah. Um, He's transitioned nicely into a coaching role, I think, this season, though. That's how it seemed to me, is for at least I've not I've not followed it closely. I feel like it, his but... his future's going to be somewhere away from football because his his personality, his his profile. Well, he's, yeah, he's already he got he's already got a brand on it, couldn't he? Well, exactly. He's he's apparently I was reading um on his Instagram and stuff. He's apparently signing a contract with the UK brand of the WWE. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean that uh, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, like. I think we were talking about it before the podcast. Listen, he's he's service to like EFL and lower league football and has been great. And he is a character that you need in in the game and and a character that people will miss. But I think, like we were saying, I think there's been a lot of narrative about him and about his journey and and things when he's not really played like much starting minutes this year and I don't think it was fair to put that sort of narrative on him I think he's had a good he's had a good career and he's had a good run but I think for a little bit too long it's probably been been about his brand rather than himself as an actual football player um so yeah, no, I can't yeah agree with that. like it's it, it'll be sad to see him go but I think it's the right time and it's probably the right time for him to move on as well I would say yeah, yeah, a bit of a shame that he can't go out on a massive high with the promotion, but a Wembley for your last game, not many players get to do that, do they? Yeah, I don't think he'll be too disappointed with that. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. That's the review of League One. Sunderland are back in the Championship. They've had four years in D through D4. It's been, well, it's been quite fun covering them, hasn't it? Seeing them yeah, be part of the family. It's been, it's been great. I mean, you know, when they came down, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I've, we've had some great interactions with Absolutely. the likes Crockett, of the Wiseman. fan base. Yeah, Wiseman Say Podcast, Roker Report, all those guys who, who um, have come on our pod over the, the last few years to give us their their thoughts about the club and interacted with us on Twitter. I really appreciate it. It's been it's been great. And I just, you know, in the nicest possible way, I don't ever want to see you guys again soon, for your own sake. I think really. they'd say the same thing back, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but they're back in the championship, as we say. Let's move down and take a look at the world's best fourth tier. Three, two. So League Two, there's three games to look at. I'm only I'm going to go briefly over the first one, which was the second of the first legs between Swindon Town and Port Vale. That took place not long after we finished recording last week, actually. Um, Swindon Town won that game 2-1. It was a, a very wet county ground. Now, if you've ever been to Swindon Town, you'll know about that Stratton Bank behind, I think it's the East Goal, if I remember right. It's, a very, it's yeah. an open stand. And it was full of Port Vale fans. And I do want to give a special mention to those on that day who braved the conditions to be in that open Stratton Bank on the day. Very big shout out to them. But I thought Swindon in that first leg were very good value for the win overall. They looked strong for the period between the first and second goals, who of course were both scored by Harry McCurdy because it had to be him, didn't it? After the season he's had against his previous club as well, it was a, a pair of goals for him, a fantastic header after a run to the near post from a corner. That speed and sudden timing of the movement really helped get away from his marker. Vell just couldn't react to his movement in time. And the technique through his second goal on the volley was absolutely class. This snapshot of waist height reminded me a bit. Do you guys remember Jesse Lingard's goal in the FA Cup final? Yeah. In 2016. Yeah. It reminded me of that, that kind of snapshot. You get so little time to react, but you just hit it and it just smoothly flies into the net. It was a really good hit. McCurdy, we know, is someone who loves being the headline grabber and he got the chance to certainly be it there. He He's someone who quite enjoys the slack he gets some opposition fans and loves being adored by the Swindon faithful. And that was shown certainly in that first leg. Um, that set us up quite nicely for the two second legs where both games were 2-1. 
it looked like the home side was quite dominant. We had Mansdale 2 0 ahead before um, Ali Koiki got a goal back to Northampton. James Wilson, likewise, got a goal back to Port Vale as well. And it set the seconds up, legs up quite nicely. And I was able to be at both of these games. I've got to say, really enjoyed both of them. I'm going to start with the one at six fields Northampton Town against Mansdale Town. Mansdale got the job done with a really impressive display overall they won the game 1-0 they got a crucial third goal from Stephen McLaughlin a case of a fullback to fullback goal and you know how much I love those James love a yeah, fullback no. to fullback goal but I was incredibly yeah. impressed with Mansfield's defensive structure and the defending in and around the box of the game I just thought they were the better team um, you know they, they turned up with a game plan they were they, they enacted it perfectly there was talk about being a bit lucky with some of the refereeing decisions. And to be honest, I'll stay away from those because until we get professional referees, we're always going to have this. And I've been blaring on about it for the five years we've been doing this, that we do need professional referees in the lower leagues because there's enough money to do it. And until we get that, you're always going to get imperfection. However, I think I'm right in saying there will be VAR available for the the playoff final and I have a feeling if it's not used properly people will quickly be more forgiving of refereeing errors because <laughs> VAR ruins football I've watched a few of the Italian games this season and it's unbelievably badly implemented and it ruins it ruins the game so was it used yesterday uh, yeah it was yeah, it was. yeah it's I, been I, used for all there was a the penalty contention wasn't there I don't I don't understand why you would have you know without getting into the merits of VAR either way why you would change it for the for the uh, playoff final because i'm not having that it's particular you know, obviously the playoff final is huge in its implications for for who goes up a division but you know it, is it is it any more huge than say bristol rovers versus um scunthorpe, uh, scunthorpe well the was. problem is you can't use it at most lowly grounds they're just not well, yeah, got it, the facilities exactly, for it. exactly so, you, so you should not use it in the playoff final as far as i'm concerned i agree and, yeah and why, why change in- why change the rules? You've got to be consistent throughout the season. It's like using the it in the FA final. Cup. Do you remember we had this debate about the FA Cup where the grounds that have it, they use it, but the grounds that they don't have it, they don't use it. Well, no, you either have it for every third round tie or none. You don't yeah. have it for the ones that can and the, and the ones that can't stuff it. You know, I'm that... still not forgiving it for Fulham away, that penalty. <laughs> that was just... <laughs> that was just so... But that's the problem with VAR. Like, oh, there was the tiniest bit of contact well therefore they're going to give the penalty we, we saw this in Italian football a lot but actually common sense should be did the contact cause the player to go down or did the player and, dive <laughs> and, it, and, and this is it because football's not a rule set it's a, it's a set of laws and and the, the, you know some people think that's sort of an academic distinction but the big distinction there is that the referee is in a position to interpret interpret it and do something in the context of the game not just make a black and white decision yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yes, um, I think I, d- I do think that Mansfield um, did deserve to get the the win. And I think that they were the better team. I think Stephen McLaughlin has been Nigel their best Croft player. I think absolutely nailed it. I did, did. I agree. The, the scariest yeah. moment from a Mansfield perspective was a minute in when Josh Epier had a header at the back post and Nathan Bishop had to put away. And that was it. Hawkins and Perch did such a great job to deal with Northampton's direct threats. You look at McLaughlin and Hewer to a great with second balls in the fullback role as well. The general defensive setup really restricted Northampton's ability to work that ball into the final third. It forced crosses and direct passes, which were dealt with well. Bishop was great off his line. You had Jordan oh, Barry and Lucas Aikens contributing out of possession as well. That game plan went perfectly, Aaron. And then they get a third aggregate goal as well to give them a cushion. Yeah, I mean, also as well, I just want to give a, um, a massive shout out to... John Joel too as well. Mm-hmm. I thought he was brilliant. Um, I, I think the what Mansfield managed to do, like you were saying, I think they restricted Sam Hoskins in the areas that he could play football, and he was playing football in areas that he probably didn't want to play football. And I think they just they just made themselves compact, and then was able to get that um, break. And like we were saying, um, McLaughlin's probably been uh, Mansfield one of Mansfield's best players this season, so he. Uh, richly deserved that. I mean, I if I'm looking from a uh, Northampton point of view, I, I would probably have to say I actually think um, Josh Epier was probably the the better, like the best player on yeah, the pitch. Yeah, I agree. But he he couldn't do it on his own, and he was very restricted up there on his own. I think, and um, I, obviously, I, I also want to mention I think. For his age, I think Stephen Quinn had an exceptional 
exceptional game as well. The whole midfield uh, three were fantastic, really. You had yeah. O'Toole put in there, normally at the back, but he had some great physicality into midfield. Wallace sat a bit deeper, flicking up the passes. Stephen Quinn was pressing from the front, which at, what, 34, 35, 36, I think off the top of my head. It's impressive. There was very, there was a lot of physicality in all three of them to the point where you asked whether maybe they should have got away with what they did. What Kieran Wallace did have a very physical challenge on Josh Epper when the ball was loose. Quinn yeah. hit Sean McWilliams around the face when Chase closing down the player. The general referee performance, James, you touched on it already. It was, it was disappointing. Quinn, some claims Quinn was initially offside from an offside position I don't know in what the build Quinn to was the goal, with but that, that punch, what yeah, the hell was he just doing? right around the face of lucky. Sean McWilliams. It was. It's disappointing. Yeah. Certainly, I do sympathise with Cobblers, David. I think we have to. It's a hard to take season, really. They've they've lost automatics by the slimmest of margins on the final day. They come up against the Mansfield side that are strong and have just got this very clinical edge, and they couldn't find enough of an answer to them over both legs. I feel quite confident though that they could challenge the promotion next year. I've become a very big fan of their striker, Louis Perry, Sean McWilliams in midfield as well. Josh Epi was a lively presence, as Aaron mentioned, down the wing for Leicester as well. I'm someone I'm quite keen to see where we end up, and I think Northampton could feel quite confident on the John Brady next year. Yeah, I th- you know, I it, yeah, look, I think it's they're they're rightful to think that it's a disappointing season in, in some respects, but I think they'll also take the positives out of this, the fact that they were so close to the playoffs, and I think you know they're sorry so close to the automatics, and and the fact that they have made it to sort of this far but I just think I completely agree with you guys' sentiments over the two legs I think you know Clough's Mansfield just sort of they've come with a game plan they've executed it well and and I just don't really feel I don't think it's a psychological thing but I just didn't really feel like they had enough um across those two legs eventually I, I I almost felt that after the first leg I mean you know as soon as that goal went in it was almost as if there was nothing from Northampton Town. But, um, yeah, c- coming to next season, I I think they'll be up and around there. Um, you know, a, a bit of smart recruitment, I'm sure they'll be fine too. But as long as they can keep some of those key players that have done really well for them this season and they can keep that defensive record, I don't think they'll keep it as well as they did this season. Um, but if they're able to kind of keep that clean sheet record and, and keep themselves... Um, you know, keep some of these key players fit and keep them at the club, in fact, because I imagine there might be a few that might Fraser be looked Horse at. Yeah, I've seen that. They're trying to keep him, aren't they? Because a yeah. uh, bit of interest in him. Uh, I saw that, uh, I mean, look, I think Northampton may lose a couple of players, but because they know how they're going to play their style and, and the and the sort of the core of that side is still there, the likes of McWilliams and, and Salby, who are very good midfielders, uh, Apare, like Ed said, has, has been impressive this season. I think Hoskins is also going to remain. He's a, a stalwart at the club, and maybe if if uh, Horsfall goes, he could be made captain. I think he deserves it for what he's he's given over the last, you know, is it seven seasons? Ridiculous, really, in this modern era of one year contracts that he's still there after all this time. But yeah, I think they'll be. I think they'll be fine. I think you look at this season, eighty points. My goodness, and they didn't go up. It's it is a tough. It's cruel, tough isn't one, it? It is cruel. It is. It is. Yeah. It's just, but that's that's the thing we love about football. Like this season has been absolutely amazing in both League One and Two. The, the quality is um, improving year on year. Absolutely. But I think I think I'm right in saying Oxford finished on their highest points total um, since returning to the Football League. Really? And we didn't even make the playoffs. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, 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 League One, I think, especially, we're, we're, we're really starting to see that you know the high quality of football i mean it's it's helped by the the amount of money that's in that league now with some well, of the we big talked clubs, about but... we talked about at the start of the season i mean our goal missed out on plus by 80 points league would stayed up with 40 you never you shouldn't be staying up with 40 points but that's no. an example of the gap that's there at the minute how dominant the top was and how poor the bottom was i, th- I think when we were battling against relegation in league one that the, the total you were looking up to be certain of safety was sort of 50 mm-hmm. if you got 45 you might get lucky 40, you should be dead and buried. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> On that occasion, they weren't, certainly. Mansfield threw to the final after a, an excellent performance at 6 yards and did an excellent performance at Mill as well. They'll be playing at Wembley. And then we came to the second leg the day after, Thursday night, Port Vale against Swindon Town. 
This was a brilliant contest. I absolutely loved it. I was able to be at the Swirl in the Lawn Street stand. Port Vale went 1-0 up early on to James Wilson. It brought the aggregate score back level. The collective atmosphere from Vale Park was excellent and really added to the occasion. The game went through all the way through normal time and added time still at 1-0. It went all the way to penalties and Port Vale found themselves seemingly out of the shoot it all together after failing to convert both the third, second and third penalties. But this remarkable turnaround saw it eventually end six sides of L on spot kicks after Ian Dolo missed Swindon's eighth and Port Vale had gone through to Wembley. I was at this game, as I said, a very enjoyable and memorable night. I look forward to getting stuck into discussing because I want to because it's brilliant. But we've got to address the elephant in the room from this game, which was what unfolded at the end of the tie. Port Vale fans flooded their way onto the pitch after winning the penalty shootout. And from my position up at the back of the Lawn Street stand, I could see that there was clearly a group of Vale fans who went straight to the Swindon players on the halfway line. And it became clear to me pretty quickly that they weren't just going there to taunt them. It got physical. And there's footage that's been circling around, which shows that it continued to be quite physical. As the Swindon players tried to make their way back into the tunnel, players were attacked. Ben Garner has said that his players were physically and verbally abused as well. Both himself and his players felt a threat to their safety following that game. And in addition to that, there was also this group of Port Vale fans who made their way right over to the bycar stand where the Swindon Town fans were based. They tried to get as close to them as possible, really, before the stewards held them back. And it wasn't long before projectiles started to be thrown in both directions. You could see bottles lying back and forth. Apparently there were coins as well. A seat got ripped out of the bycar stand as well as being thrown back and forth between the pitch and the stand. There's reports of head injuries suffered by fans following it as well. What's happened after that penalty shootout, boys, has left a dampener on what was a fantastic night of football. And what's really annoyed me and concerned me, this isn't the first incident we've had of fan behaviour crossing a line in a football game. It's not even the first incident we've had this week. And it's really concerning me. It's It's got to stop. The welfare of both players and supporters is at serious risk if this continues to allow to happen at football games. I think the thing the thing that really upsets me about what we're seeing as well, like you say, is it's the... the the maybe third time we've seen this happen this uh, week, including in a couple of the Prem games, obviously the Crystal Palace Patrick Vieira incident being the most notable one there. Um, but it just it shows that football fans think they have like a, a forgiving right to be able to do, say, touch, do whatever they want to an opposition player just because you beat them in a football match. And the thing that's really annoying me is you can guarantee any of them. Um, Swindon players or like or like Patrick Vera for instance, they're the ones that are gonna get in trouble like for defending themselves. And like I had I, I struggle with that me because them fans could have had anything on them, you know what I mean? You've got to be able to defend yourself, especially you, you take because... that out of a on a football pitch context and just put it on a street in any town. Yeah, back alley or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, this this is threatening, violent behaviour from people whose IQ is so small that when they walk, their brain rattles around in their head. You know, this is the kind of Neanderthals we're talking about here because like and, and they tarnish like the reputation of for the Port Vale game. This this game was a, a wonderful match of football. The vast majority of those fans who ran on the pitch were celebrating correctly with their players. And yet this group of idiots has ruined the occasion for everyone. And and why go and go to Swindon fans? Like, that's just utterly stupid. People forget, I mean, how bad football was in the in the 80s. You know, um, it well, led to fans way. being treated so badly by authorities that fences were put up around grounds. We had tragedies in football stadiums, Hillsborough being the most notable, but there are others. Fans lost their lives because they weren't treated properly by authorities. You know, we've moved away from that so far. And I do not want to see us go back to that. Well, I'm, I'm, it, I, I, I'm told that they, they are looking into putting netting up at matches now. Not not fences, but netting. It, yeah, it's yeah going, but that's a slippery it's, slope, isn't it? It's going to punish. Know. Whole fan bases as a whole are going to end up being punished because of an idiotic few. And I, I know it's a few and people point out to few, but the problem is that there is a few. They're the ones causing the issue here. And yeah. we as fan bases as a whole will end up being punished for it. It has got I think to fan start bases that. need to root out these idiots. I mean, I really do. It's like... The same as racism and, and those sort of comments you get from fans. You need to root out the people doing it so that it doesn't ruin football well, for everyone else who, who has no interest in this sort of anarchy and, and frankly, just stupidity. You know, Andy Holt summed it up really well. He has he been did. working so, so hard to get um, the authorities to relax some of the rules around how fans are treated. He wants to have mixed 
mixing of home and away fans, make it a real sort of uh, fun day out to go to Accrington. And he'd been making great progress. This is only going to stop uh, people. You know, this is going to make people think twice. The authority is going to think twice. You know, safe standing, it might affect that as well, which we all want to see come back into into football grounds. Honestly, it's it's utter, utterly ridiculous. And the fact is, these are these are criminal behaviours. It doesn't matter if it takes place on a football pitch. It's criminal behaviour. They need to be prosecuted. And I think if there if there's an option to do so, you absolutely give them the most harshest penalties that are legally allowed, yeah. so that it, it acts as a deterrent. Because well, the, and, and the issue is, you, you've got you've got you've got clubs like like Oldham now who have who have weaponised this this last week. You know, you, you, you've got the the occasions where you're having situations where fans are storming the pitch and engaging in clearly horrible criminal behaviour. And then you've got the situation at Oldham where there was a, a, a largely peaceful protest and the club are now engaging with Greater Manchester Police to have fans banned and potentially punished legally. Uh, and just this stupid behaviour of people being aggressive. I mean, we saw, we saw it with Billy Sharp as well in, in the That was game. horrific. Uh, I mean, it's it's been what, now, what, what, uh, what, what is going on with this? And, you know, at Oldham matches this season, I've, I've seen behind stands, people just going up and thumping people in the back of the head. There is this this really concerning rise in what can only be described as hooligan behaviour. And it is so frustrating when when myself and, and many others have been calling on police and stewards to be a bit more respectful of football fans. But actually... At this point, it's quite difficult to argue that when there is actually a serious risk of, of, of harm to people. Well, most stewards, police is different, but most stewards are just volunteers or on low paid. I, I didn't even mention there was an incident at the end of the Northampton Mansfield game as well, where someone from the home end got onto the pitch and threw in an orange slayer. That makes me think they won a Northampton bar- fan, by the way, with the orange slayer. But <laughs> I don't know for sure whether it was or not, but they got on the pitch as well. And the stewards... They're not going to react to that. They're, they're volunteers like you or I would be most of the time. Some of them are paid very low wages to do it. They're, they're not going. They're not prepared to react to someone getting onto the pitch and responding quickly to it. What did well, the guy who Aaron you were saying the guy who headbutted Billy Sharp? What is it? What was his punishment? Twenty four months in jail. Twenty four weeks in prison. Twenty four weeks. I, think so, I mean, it. honestly, that that's such a pathetic you I, know i think, uh, I think it was 24 punishment. weeks I'll, I'll double check that i thought no i think i'm, I'm on the bbc news article that's his really short yeah 20 24 weeks what for you know that could for i'm not being funny but the, he it's ran assault. full pelters it, it's it's grievous bodily like, harm isn't it it's it, 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 i'm not actual, being funny it's, it's, it's abh it was a, it was actual bodily harm he was convicted for Imagine if Billy Sharp had fallen and, and, and he, hit his head again. You know, he, and, and he's also been charged for entering the pitch illegally. That's not a deterrent, if you ask me. I mean, the guy could. I know it sounds a bit dramatic, but Billy Sharp could have been much more seriously hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and so we've, Matt, we've seen it from the more innocuous things where people have fallen in in arguments and, and died because they banged their head. I mean, this guy headbutted him at full pelt, and then. Oh, in order to pay five hundred pounds in compensation, eighty five pounds in costs, and one hundred and twenty eight pounds in victim surcharge. And I assume nothing, he's got a long, long ban from football matches as well. Uh, he, he'll have a, uh, I imagine he'll have a football ban in order as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, it says it, it says he was um, the judge had been urged to pass a suspended sentence because uh, the guy claimed his girlfriend wouldn't be able to keep up with monthly mortgage payments. He should, have, he, he should have really <laughs> thought about that before he decided to. I, yeah, I just I don't understand them. what goes and, through your head. And it, and you, you, you you win a game, you should be celebrating the fact you're making it to Wembley. And your first instinct is to go to the opposition players, the opposition fans. I just don't get it. It's, it's, been, it's been raised in the news as well this week, and, and the government are looking at it, uh, the use of cocaine at football matches. Now, without getting into to arguments on the merits of, of drug bans or whatever, people are going to football matches, getting coked up and acting like morons. And it, it's it's really it's really really horrible to see because you know for me, football's a day out with your family or a day out with your friends. It, it's not an opportunity to go and get, you know, really wildly drunk, coked up, and do you know act like an idiot. I just it doesn't feel like it's the right place for that. Um, uh, there's all this talk about pitch invasions not being allowed, you know, and all this sort of stuff. I mean, I I have been on the pitch at the Sam Stadium when Oxford beat Russian and Diamonds in our playoff semi final back in 2009 10. Um, and, you know, people say, well, you shouldn't go on until you've won something. But Oxford have been on a downward spiral for years. It was like a relief of, 
you know, <laughs> finally we've, we've won something and we've, we've won an important match first time in years. So, and, and that was really peaceful. No fans goaded the Russian fans or anything. It was like, and I liked that. It's kind but, of accepted, isn't it? That if you, if you, I mean, all of it used to sort of be a bit of a tradition just for the last game of the season. You'd run on the pitch and have a bit of fun and then go off and they'd come around and do their lap yeah. of I'd, semi-honour. I'd, I'd hate to see this uh, all change because of the actions of some... Well, of I, I think about but, some of these weird scenes at Exeter and at Bristol Rovers when they got under promotion. That that was great, but there's a line you can't cross and people have been crossing it. We've seen into the it, it, last it, week it, alone. It, 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 ignore the opposition, you've won. Exactly, I just don't get why you, your instinct's that. Just go and celebrate with your players. That's the, that's a great moment. So you see, and anyway, you've seen the scenes from Bristol it's... Rovers and the players up on knees. Yeah. And all. That's fantastic. I don't get why people wouldn't care only about that. But just again, to be clear, I feel like our general consensus here is that we're not condoning the fact of celebrating on the pitch. Like, so for anyone listening, we're not you, saying don't celebrate on the pitch if you've if you've you know won something. Don't celebrate on the pitch if you're Everton and you're staying up in the Premier League. By the way, that's, sure. That's just, uh, no. <laughs> But but also, like, if you're going to do that, do it in a way that isn't being a complete dick. Like, don't go after don't opposition be an fans. Yeah. Yeah, d- don't go after the opposition fans. Don't go... What do you, what do you uh, guys think? I mean, issues. Patrick Vieira being goaded like that by a fan. Why, why would you go to Patrick Vieira? But he has every right to sort of... I think I saw someone in. grab their hands around Christian and Benteke as well. Or someone put their hands on him. There's a video of that going around. I just, I just don't. Well, I don't think Patrick. I think Patrick Vieira is within his right to give that guy a good hiding. I mean, honestly, so, so yeah, lump in one. Yeah, he yeah. probably should have kicked him a little bit harder. To be fair, yeah, the thing exactly. is, is got, got any away. other, as we've already said, any other walk of life, if someone comes up to you like that, or, or they're goading you in terms of like getting right in your face and stuff like that, you have a right to defend yourself. I don't understand why. It's not okay for sportsmen to defend themselves when they're literally, they are literally in their work environment. This, this is the thing that I think sometimes people forget. The, these men are literally in their work environment. You're invading their work yeah. environment to attack them. If somebody attacked you at work, <laughs> they're, they're done. Like you can't go into someone's <laughs> yeah, if, workplace if, 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 if and I'm attack at my them. desk and someone comes up to me and, and, and just lamps you on. Like, <laughs> just just lamps lamps you on. You, do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> unacceptable. You can't go up to someone in their workplace and, and attack them. It's just it's insane to me that we so, you're like, right. Some some people you don't just are walk into Curry's PC world, do you? And smack, <laughs> smack <laughs> someone over the head with the TV screen. This computer is too expensive. <laughs> But it, it is literally that, though, isn't it? it, is, it yeah. It's like you could just walk into an it's like walking into an office or a supermarket or something like that and saying, "Oh, you're like I don't like your tomatoes," and, and hitting <laughs> them or like like it. it but you, you are we we laugh, them. we laugh, but it is the most ludicrous thing. But still, for some reason. These people wouldn't go and do that in a supermarket. They a man wouldn't being go assaulted, assaulted with a pineapple or something. Yeah. Right, but they they're more than happy to do that when it comes to people being at work on a sports ground. And yes, you can make the debate about pe- they earn lots of money or whatever, but actually that doesn't really come into it's it at all. These are people. It. Well, exactly. These are people that are working. They're they're at their job. And they're having to in the city earn a lot of money. You don't go into their offices and lump well, them. Well, exactly. Like they're they're people that are still at work that they're, they're still doing their job what they what they you know the stuff they're getting paid for and then pe- we have a small section across football like not just even certain clubs it's across football of just small minority idiots, groups idiots that idiots think every, it's acceptable in every crowd fan base i think that's that's the truth i mean but again ed like let's talk about the match because this is what yeah is, i i, I want, I want to draw a line under that i'm glad we've had that talk i appreciate you guys inputting on that but i want to draw a line under that today and put focus back on the game because I loved it. It was fantastic. Right, yeah. The contrast between the Port Vale performance in this game and the one the county ground was huge. There was a bump of Vale Park crowd, as I mentioned, really helped enhance the atmosphere in the occasion. I'm not someone who's massive on this idea of home advantage. This idea that having a greater number in the home crowd than the away crowd gives the home side a lift is something that I think better applies to certain clubs over others, certainly. But Vale Park on that Thursday night was absolutely one of them. They made the decision to switch the ends, actually. They normally put the away fans in what's called the Hamill Road stand to the south and home supporters go up in the bycar stand to the north, but they switched them over because the Hamill Road stand is a very large but usually pretty empty stand because of the thumb bases that you have down at this level. And they made the decision and said, to put that full of Vale supporters with the way fans going in the bycars behind the goal 
And it's an idea I think Port Vale could consider going forward, certainly. If the possibility is there to fill that Hamill Road stand each game, then I think she could take it. It's a bumper crowd on what is one of the biggest grounds in all League Two. And it created an atmosphere, James, that did certainly lift that place and that Port Vale team. You could see that in the display the players put in. They started absolutely brilliantly, didn't absolutely. they, Port Vale? Um, you can't deny they deserved uh, to, to get back in that match. They, they limited Swindon, and in particular people like Harry McCurdy, their key players, Jackie Payne, to, to very little um, and they looked a huge threat I mean I think the only disappointing thing for them is that they didn't really take more of an advantage of this start and and, and get a, a couple of goals when they were on top in the match I mean they, they struggled a little bit in the second half to keep the pace up I, I noticed but yeah no I was really impressed with Port Vale and you know Vale Park's a massive pitch as well so having that you know it feels like a, you know, it's the Wembley of the North wasn't it when it was built so it's it's kind of um, great to see how that club has has been turned around by the Shanahan's, the owners, and and getting all those fans in, and you know, it's nice for Daryl Clark after what he's been through to to get this team to uh, Wembley. He's very clear when he came out on the balcony to, or in the top end of the stand to sort of celebrate with the fans. He kept saying, "One more, one more. We've won nothing yet." So, yeah. you know, I think they've got to focus very much on that because um, playing think- Mansfield in the final is going to be tricky. But I thought. Loads to really appreciate with this team. The the back three I could give a mention to themselves. You had James Gibbons, uh, Nathan Smith in the middle and Connor Hall on the right. It's not the usual back three we've had, but on this occasion they nailed it. Gibbons pushing forwards down the right on that overlap from David Worrell. He's just perfect for that wide overlapping centre-back role as someone who's, who's naturally a full-back. How right good is Nathan, Nathan Smith? Like, well, Nathan good is Smith, he? he sat tight on Josh Davidson, who was Swins number nine, and limited his chances to get solid control of the ball, particularly in that first half. And the job Connor Hall did on Carrie McCurdy out on the left, yeah. he essentially silenced him. Every time that ball came to McCurdy, he might stand up Hall and look at him a couple of times, but the amount of times he'd, he'd end up drifting inside onto the left, and the only thing in front of him was the traffic of players, and he'd have to go and play it back out wide to Mandela Egbo again. He was so limited in his attacking output, and that's because of what Connor Hall did in him. Um, Port what Vale's, a signing he's been, yeah, by the way. Yeah, he's been brilliant. Right. I didn't think he was that much of a standout for Harrogate, but at Port Vale, he's looked one of the best centre-backs in the league. Yeah, really I, I think one of the biggest things that's telling of this match, though, is the fact that given the end of the first half, obviously Wilson had that chance, which I have no idea how he missed the first one. Oh. It probably should have been 2-0 anyway. Um, but the fact is, at the end of that half, to just give an illustration of how well, like, Harry McCurdy was on fire in the first leg. They shut him down so well, he only had 13 touches throughout the entirety of the first half. And they were all out in wide he, positions as well. And it was the least amount of touches of any player on the pitch. And yeah, they were, and they fr- like, it well. was, yeah, it was, it was their, was it Davison that was their striker? Josh Davison, yeah. yes. So, right, so yeah, Josh Davison and Harry McCurdy were the two players that had 13 and 14 touches, the least amount of touches on the entirety of the pitch. Like, they were, I think they showed at half time, there was like, you know, three or four play. well, they showed like a list of like six players, and three of them were the, were the Swindon front line. I, um, I've got to hold my hands up here and admit when I feel like I've got something wrong, and Chris is probably knows what's coming, but I I think Ben Gary was exceptional in that midfield. I think he's been he's been brilliant for Port Vale all season he, he, and he has been I, all season. That's why that's why I'm so pissed off by him. I just <laughs> I can say if he is listening, I would like to uh, publicly apologise for ever slating him because I realise it's probably to do with the shit of quality of players he had around him during his time at no, Oldham. I, I, I can't he, buy it. He he's been brilliant this year. I thought I thought he controlled the tempo of that game. I really did. I, and I'm I'm sat here quite smug because uh my projections for the League Two playoff game is is well on track. I think um no, but in all seriousness, I I think um even even when the likes of like Ryan Edmondson came off the bench, I thought his his pace and and the way they were able to sort of like stretch the the Swindon backline with, with his pace when they came on, I just thought it was a perfect game and a perfect game management by Daryl Clark. I think we need to talk about off. the goal, the opening goal from James Wilson. But great work from Keen Harrow, who was excellent, by the way. And I, I thought he had a fantastic game, getting the ball across to him to back post the second attempt. However, there was a clear handball for Mal Benning at the other end oh, at the start. That was horrendous. Very clear. Mixed from the lines, but <laughs> we talked about the officials for thought, but that wasn't a great moment. Mm, it's lead two. It's I say officials get loads of things wrong. 
And I'll I'll keep banging the drum. I don't want VAR. I just want professional officials. If you've got an, a professional division where jobs and and livelihoods are on the line, the foot there's enough money in football to have professional officials at these games. It's as simple okay. as that. I'll tell you what I'll tell you what I do like. I like the goal line technology. Yeah, that's fine. That's I like, like that. Hawkeye, isn't it? A lot of sort of thing, you know. Yeah, that's definitely. Yeah, but even that messed up. Jez, I want to give a little mention to the Swindon players because they did grow into the game more at that time. I've I've always really liked Mandela and Doug Bow down. Mandela, I can't get the name right. Mandela Egbo down that right hand flank. He's he's played everywhere at the right. He's been at right back. He's in a very dynamic role. Jack Payne got a lot more lively on the ball in the second half. John and Williams found some opportunities to carry that ball through midfield at speed as well. I really like Dion Conroy and Matteo Belgi actually the centre back partnership put in a very composed display. Pretty comfortable taking that ball out and distributing under pressure as well. Josh Davison up top had a very tough time of it. A lot of game with the back to goal, very tightly marked by Nathan Smith, as we say. It really requires an excellent first touch to work in those conditions, and I would have to say that wasn't always there. They got Ben Gladwin on, switched to a 4 one quite beneficial, as I felt Louis Barry on the left had been pretty quiet until he came off. And by the end of the game, Swindon were at 3 5 2 with Jacob Bryan deployed in the middle of the back line, and Ian Dolo and Egbo pushed up a bit higher. I think Swindon got into this a lot more and did make it a pretty good contest with the game 1 0 through extra time and added time. Yeah, it was always going to happen, though. They're a really good team. They've been a, a really good footballing side all season. You could argue, I mean, you could argue that the best uh, in terms of the style they play um, this season, I think maybe Forest Green, another side that would uh, would be shouting about that. But they have got excellent players. You know, and there was this narrative as well on, on social media that, oh, they've spent all this money and, you know, they've been they've got a huge wage bill. No wonder they're good. I mean, I didn't, it's not something I recognise. They were under a transfer embargo. They were on, they took yeah, the I EFL loan. I think, I think they've just been very savvy in how they recruited. I don't think they've... I, I know the money... Look at Harry McCurdy. No one wants yeah. him. You know, they took exactly. a chance on him and they, they, they got they got fortunate with him. I think Jack Payne was their last season. So, any, you know, yes, he, they probably couldn't have afforded him and the likes of Williams beforehand but they they recruited really well they didn't have a big squad they relied on free transfers loans and stuff like that so uh, that narrative they can knock that on the head I think they're just a a really well coached team who play good football the Conroy incident with Daryl Clark yeah we have got to mention that Daryl Clark thinking he was trying to collect a ball that went out of play and Conroy's clashed with him and the the heads have gone together and Clark said a red card and I think Conroy was booked as well I just thought the whole thing was I think Clark will be is he actually allowed on the touchline for the final I don't think he is now, is he? Well, the red card stands, he won't be. I'd yeah. imagine he'll get a touchline ban for the first game or so for next season as well. well. Why, why wouldn't he be Wembley? Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's yeah. I just think it's a silly, it's a silly thing for him to get involved in. I know he probably emotions for him maybe running higher than perhaps normal, but you know, it. it, it I just looked at it and thought this is un- the most unnecessary yeah. sort of handbags that you'll see, and and it for him not to be on the touchline in an important game. I mean. Fortunately, he's got Andy Crosby, who's an excellent coach, um, ex Oxford centre back, I have to mention as well. Um, who, you know, who can. Who, who ask, isn't? I've convinced who isn't half it? the world played for Oxford at some point, Jason, with the way you talk about them. Honestly, yeah, Andy Crosby was good. He was, he was a really good centre back. And, uh, you know, he's been a really good stand. I think he's done excellent work standing in for Daryl Clark this season. So he'll, he'll be, you know, fine at Wembley. Yeah. But um, who wants to make a call on who wins between Vell and. Mansfield, well, I, mean, I might ask you to get onto that in a bit. It was it was a tense affair for the the, Swin, the Port Vale Swindon game all the way through the night minutes to the extra thirty. Goes to penalties in front of the by cars down where the Swindon fans are based. I mean, this penalty shootout could have been event all on its own without the game, and it would have been gripping entertainment the way it, it went. It, it, it summed up the, the two ties. It did actually, yeah. So, 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 so Swindon took control, really should have finished it off. McCurdy's miss but, but, is but, being but, replayed but, but, quite but a lot. Stephen Port Vale took advantage. <laughs> It's a McCurdy Baggio, wasn't it? You know, yeah. World Cup 94 <laughs> final. But yeah, when Baggio hit it over. I mean, he fluffed that big time. And I had actually thought that Edmondson... Has anyone seen the video the of Kevin Ellison, by the way? Seen. Where he catches, where he the, ball catches the ball from Steve. McCurdy's yeah. pants. Uh, oh, yeah, that's Kev. funny. Love it. And I found, what I found really strange, I, I get he's a maverick and he's obviously a little bit, little bit nuts. And I like that in a player. But did, did you notice that his first reaction was to laugh and stick his song out? I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. I think he's just he's saying, just oh, he knows he's looked like a fool and he's thinking, oh. Um, into that, I think, I think I'd, I'd do the same because it's not a, yeah, I don't think that's a, a, a joy sort of laugh. That's a. <laughs> 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 that's what have I done? Yeah, exactly <laughs> like that. A couple of things I noticed also during that shoot, I just want to say. Um, 
the dog's involved now, it seems to be as well. Um, Sorry. I, I'm, <laughs> that's fine. Down the lawn street, up in the Lord Street sand, watching the players lined up on the line as well as you'd have to have two outs. Chris Hussey for Port Vale, wasn't part of the squad, was still at the pitch. He was looking away from a big penalty as well. He was, clearly wasn't involved in getting involved. But Kean Harrop was really looking to get that crowd and the rest of the team going every single penalty. Kean Harrop is on loan from Huddersfield Town. He's not even Port Vale's player. And the passion he was showing towards that shootout at the end was magnificent. And I think really he's great, a player I'm very excited to, get... to see more of in the future. Absolutely. Great chance for him to get to Wembley as well for a, for a young player, you know, in a huge game. I mean, it's an achievement for Port Vale and all these players of, of making it uh, to the final. And I think um, there are some players who it dawns on a lot earlier uh, than others. And a lot of players will admit that when they look back um, after finishing their career, it's those moments that they perhaps didn't realise how important they were. I think and so, you know, it's important to grasp them when they come because they come around. If you think about a footballer's career, if you make it to Wem- make make it to Wembley and have these moments where you win playoff semi final shootouts, they rarely happen. These are, you've really got to enjoy those moments. It makes it makes playing at Barrow on a sort of Tuesday night in the in the howling wind and rain. Why is it Barrow? Leave him alone. That, it's it's the weather you get there, isn't it? Off that off that is it the estuary or what? The weather you, know, the you get is at Oldham. Come on, coldest place on earth. Playing at, at Fleetwood. <laughs> you know, I think playing also what what. Um, we didn't touch upon with the um, Daryl Clark red card just to go back to it. Is that if he does miss this game at Wembley, he said in his interview, it's obviously Mansfield is 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 like hometown club, and it's, he said it's where his um, eldest daughter was born. So he said it would be an emotional day for him. So is that that will be a way for him not to be on the touchline in, in that sort of sense as well. But I think just going back to the game, I think obviously the um, the Port Vale keeper took a took a whack as well just before the penalties, didn't he? So I think he did he did uh, he did well, and uh, look, I think I think that was probably one of the more entertaining penalty shootouts I've seen in a long time. It's been some uh, Stone, tables. of course, yeah. going back to take on Mansfield, isn't it? Harry uh, Charlesley yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. We will touch on it this playoff final, Mansfield Town v Port Vale. It's next Saturday, 4 p.m. kickoff, I believe. By the time we do the next pod, it will be decided. I would ask you guys your thoughts on who you think is going to win, but I don't really want to force you because I can't make my mind up out of these two. Yeah, it's, really I'm, I'm tempted to just say <laughs> the team with the English manager is going to win. Ah, I'm tempted to just go with that, but Aaron's going I'm to stick his neck out. I'm sticking by my word document that's done me well so far. I'm going to go Port Vale. Mm. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Because I, 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 I can't Ma- decide, I it, honestly. I, I'm going to go Mansfield, not because I don't want Port Vale to do it or have any skin in this, but I looked at how they dealt with Northampton and I just think that that was so superbly done um, over the two legs that in a one-off game, maybe they are more likely to turn up with a game plan that works and I'd probably back Nigel Clough to to do it one more time this season, but it's going to be... Perhaps, but I I remember I was at the game earlier in the season at Port Vale v Manchester Vale Park as well, where Port Vale completely turned the game around as well and they dominated them there. It's going to be a really, really good contest. Chris or Chris or David, do you have any thoughts on it? I'm I'm going Port Vale just on a pure gut instinct. I have absolutely no good, idea. I'm not the um, only one. I'm glad I'm not the only but one. I feel like my record so far has served me well at voting for the opposite no, club. So is... who... No, you said this last week. You can't do this again. David, you're <laughs> supposed to provide quality insight. <laughs> <laughs> my quality is to provide the opposite no okay i i'm gonna go for mansfield town because i for similar reasons to james but i feel like across the two legs yes port vale did well against a very good swindon town side um but for me the way the the way mansfield were at, at northampton and just how they've been all this season um i i think you know it's very much going to come down to a battle for Port Vale as as to whether they can get Wilson into those sort of positions that they've been trying to previously. But I feel like Mansfield will do a very good job at shutting that out. Um, and for me, they're going to go up to League One. So that that means that means Port Vale are definitely winning. <laughs> it's not how this works. 
It's not as well. <laughs> tooth the man still tooth Port Vale. I'm going to back the team with the English manager, so I'm going to play it safe. Right, two more little bits of news to talk. You, you can't have a, you're sorry, you can't have a I was going to say you can't. Not, you oh, can't no, do I don't choice. want to pick. You have to pick. I don't you want can't to do, do it. That. You, you, you have to decide. I don't want to pick. People are listening now, ready on the keyboards, yeah. ready to tag me in things and say, "Why well, you're not backing <laughs> us? What's going on here?" I had it already. Look, I thought it was going to be Northampton Swindon. I've got no input on this final. I've got the playoff final yeah. semi-finals wrong. I don't want to comment on do this it. one. You're the, you're the host who <laughs> persuaded all And you think two Oldham fans have an input in a league one player? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think we know about playoffs? <laughs> <laughs> it's all guesswork. Give it a go. All right, fine. If if I had to go with one, I edge towards Mansfield. There we go. There we well, go. I don't, was that, I, so, was I, that so hard? Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> Yes, it was. We'll, we'll find out what happens. Cue the comments. Come next week. Yeah, please leave it alone. <laughs> Any messages, send it to David Jenkins 16 on Twitter. That will sign <laughs> Two bits of news I'm going to touch on. We'll get. I'll go a bit more into these next week because we haven't really got time now. And we'll dedicate more to the second to the next week's pod. Johnny Jackson's been appointed the manager of ASC Wimbledon. Gary Bowyer has been dismissed from his role at Salter City, replaced by Neil Woods. I'll go a bit more in detail on those next week, I think, with the podcast where next week we'll look at the League Two playoff final, review some of the manager change we've had. Might even ask for a little Q&A from you lot as well. Give a chance to get your questions across because it's always quite fun to talk about and what is the last scheduled pod of the season. But that concludes this episode. My thanks to all four of you. The contributions to this one have been very good. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thank yeah, you. Good fun. Very enjoyable. We will see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.